give a brief story for, for myself. Um, as you can imagine, my story is similar to Lynette's in, in many ways, starting with a conservative Christian community and uh, of many generations. When you're born into something, you're just into something, and you participate in that. But I realized very early on that I wanted to, I wanted to break out of that. I, I at least wanted to diversify. And I remember um, uh, my my tradition. The, the, uh, when I was in high school, uh, all the girls were in the Baptist church, and so I figured well, I'm going to become a Baptist. And uh, so I became the <laughs> I became the president of the Baptist youth group in high school. And I went, uh, this is fun. Uh, we had great choirs and all. I went, and so I really enjoyed the Baptist community when I was in high school. Um, I, I knew I was, you know, I've been trained differently, and I, I but it was fine. I, I just enjoyed that diversity. Um, and when I was in college, my area of interest was pre-med and healthcare. That's where I was focused on uh, in college, and uh, and 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 yet it just it didn't work that way. It just didn't work out where I could I could go on to med school. And so then I began the search of who am I and what am I doing, and I met Lynette at the University of Oregon, and I was studying genetics at that point, uh, master's level genetics, when I met Lynette. It's just continuing to try and, and hone this interest in, in, in health care that I had. Um, and met Lynette and, and uh, needed a job to pay for all the bills that that was going to generate. And uh, that, that, that's a little facetious. Lynette does not generate you know. bills. Um, and, uh, and so went to work I'm for the pharmaceutical sure. industry and worked for them for a decade, working all the way up the ladder till I was, I was responsible for University of Washington Healthcare, uh, med, med school. So I was fascinatingly in med school through a different door. And uh, and so while we were in Seattle, I uh, I, I, I had one of the, one of my gastroenterologists say, Brian, you could do better. But, but appreciate what you're doing, but you could do better. And I went, okay, well, what would that be? And I had a fascinating interest in bioethics, and bioethics is is the philosophy of healthcare. And so I realized that I couldn't find people that were trained in in philosophy in the philosophy of healthcare, very few. And I decided, well, I can do that. And so I went hunting for the doctoral program in bioethics, and lo and behold, if it wasn't the religion department of USC in, in uh, Los Angeles, and I went, sounds good. Off I, I, I sort of like religion. I, I wanted to, to get my, my program in bioethics started. And so all of a sudden, I found myself uh, on a journey, and I realized I better go to seminary and get some background so that I could go on to my doctoral studies at a, at a, in a religion department. So I picked the broadest seminary I could find because I, I knew what my tradition was and I, you know, I, I wanted to learn more. So I picked Fuller Theological Seminary, which is 105 denominations all into one seminary. It's just a crazy milieu of Christianity in one place. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed that for my master's program, but I got the call and I was accepted into the doctoral program at USC. And I realized, well, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get a backdoor PhD in religion while I'm getting my doctoral study work in bioethics. And that's what happened. And, and I realized that might be my pathway. I might have to find a professorship in a department of religion so that I too can do my healthcare and my bioethics, which is exactly what happened. When I finished up, the first call I got was the Department of Religion at Warner Pacific University in Portland. They wanted me to do the same thing. We'd like to come in as a religion scholar uh, and, and do a lot of other things. And if you want to do this bioethics, that's sort of on the side and wherever you go. So I arrived at, uh, in, in Portland, and lo and behold, if I wasn't teaching world religions as my primary topic. And I went, oh, well, I'm trained. Let's do this, uh, and tried to build the bioethics on the side. Uh, and so when, when a position opened up in here in McCall, it was for a pastoral position. And I went, cool, now I'm close to the, pl the place I wanted to be because I knew there was no bioethics in the Treasure Valley, almost none. And if I could get close, then I could build a bioethics program in Boise I, and I could, and I could uh, do my work here. Well, being called to, to be a pastor really I learned fairly quickly that I have some weaknesses in that field, and they came out pretty strongly. 
And, uh, and so I only managed to do that a few years. Uh, enjoyed it for what it offered, but I knew I was still in the wrong place. But I knew a college was the most important thing we could build in this town. And uh, very early on, I saw that a community college style college could do it. And, uh, and so I began to build the foundation of a community college here in McCall. Uh, and, and I was scared of religion. I just didn't think I could teach religion and have any success in, in religion. So I built the bioethics in, in the major hospitals down in Boise, and I commute down there every week and, and build and build and build and build with limited success, mainly because the college here wasn't strong enough. It didn't give me enough power in the medical community that I needed to really sink my teeth into the idea. Well, lo and behold, if, if arts and humanities didn't say, we'd, we'd like you to teach a course in Introduction to World Religion. Well, I'm seven years now into McCall, <laughs> hadn't taught a dang thing in religion while I've been here. And I went, sure, didn't think anything would happen. They, they opened the doors and 20 people showed up in Jody's living room uh, wanting to, to know about Jainism and, uh, and eventually shamanism. And I went, wow, have I been missing something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, all my work, I spent 10 years at, at, at Warner Pacific teaching world religions. Uh, and every time, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it, just going through all the religions. And, and I developed a love for each and every one of them. Um, but it became really obvious that the Buddhist community needed a catalyst here in this town. And by launching into that, so that immediately after we finished Jainism, I said, I think we need to teach Buddhism and see what, what, what would happen if we taught Buddhism. To another 20 people, totally different 20, showed up for that next session of Buddhism. And I went, we're on to something here. And so Jody and I said, we really need to, to begin trying to build a structure for this. Um, and and we, need a, we, we need a community that could develop the, the Buddhist ideas here in town. And so she said, well, she, you know, she would work on it over the summer. And over the summer, it became really quite a challenge because it's McCall summer. And... And you just get this ebb and flow of people coming in and out. And, and it really never locked in. Um, but as I came into this course, I was hoping again that, that we could begin to build a Buddhist community here in, in this community. Uh, and that I could serve as that role of the catalyst. How do we, how do we encourage that community? Because my, my goal, if I were to have a goal, is any 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 religious community that isn't represented, then let's build it while we're learning about it. Um, and, so, and so when it comes to, to sort of my, my agenda, my, my objective of this course is to, is, to, is to welcome all seekers of religious studies and spirituality. I have learned that whatever tradition you bring to the table, it becomes stronger if you study your tradition or another tradition. And the reason is fairly simple. You will compare everything you learn, if it's a new religion, to your existing religion, and you become stronger in your own religious tradition, uh, just because you're exposing it to different material. And that has been by far the, the most routine result of all of my teaching in the religions of the world. Um, and so I've enjoyed all of the religious traditions, uh, and I enjoy teaching all of them. Um, I realize that most people um, come to these religious traditions, you know, often the, the courses that teach them are usually in, in, in the majority of cases in America, in Christian settings. And, and when they're taught in those settings, they often come with the wrong edge. And it's very, very hard to actually learn in those settings because the instruction tends to come with an apologetic with it. We really like our religion. I have to teach you this religion. I'm going to undercut it as I teach it to you. I hope you don't mind because at the end of the day, I've got to prove that I'm the institution's religion and not this new religion, which always drove me nuts. It just was the wrong way of teaching any religion. And so I've had the, the incredible joy of opening the door to understanding Buddhism and the religions of India to all students with a focus on the spirituality of yoga. My goal as an instructor is for you to think I'm Buddhist. That, that's my goal. So that you really sense, wow, he, he really loves this. He, he enjoys teaching it. He, he, he senses what he's 
he, he's done his best to learn as much as he can to deliver it in, in front of students uh, and has a love for what he's teaching. That's, that's my goal in every course. It, it's certainly my goal in this course. And yet, and yet most, 90, you know, if you were to poll anybody, they would assume that a religion should be taught by only those within the religion, that that's the best way to learn it. I would argue I bring something to the table. Uh, I bring that comparative religion capacity that allows you to see the religion in a comparative lens to every other religion. I think there's a real strength to that. I hope there is, because that's what I bring to the table. Um, and, and, and I hope I can advance the faith of all spiritual practitioners in their own faith. But look at the last one. I would like to build an academic center for Buddhist thought and practice in McCall College. How many of those do you think there are in the state of Idaho? Academic? Academic center. Mm. Okay. Mm. I don't know of any. Mm. Okay. And so that's my challenge. I think McCall is a wonderful, especially summertime setting of study of the religions. Um, and, but I need a Buddhist, I need a Buddhist uh, center of focus. And so I place in front of you and the other 20 that I've, I've already had a chance to, to inter, introduce and develop their Buddhist thought, that, that that's my goal, folks, is to really make a center of Buddhist studies here in our community. Um, and that's what I, I would like to catalyze. Uh, and, and, and serving as the, in the leadership of McCall College, it's something we can get done together. And that's cool. Uh, let alone any other area that you're interested in. That is what I'd like to do. Um, and so, what, what questions does that spark? When I say it, we, we, need, a, we need a focused center of folks that are, 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 are looking towards Buddhist thought as, as developmental. And, and, and if, if we could build a Sangha in, in, uh, in this town, that would be wonderful. What do I do to help would be my, would be my uh, input into that kind of idea. And so, and, and Kate and I have had, this, have had these interesting conversations as to, as to what would it be like to grow one in this. And, and, and so that's, that's where, I, where I come. I, I don't come as an adherent in the tradition. I come as an enjoyer and a lover of all traditions, but particularly Buddhism, uh, for many reasons, which I, I will share with you. Um, but how do, how do we make our time together real in the sense of, of building a community of, of people that enjoy Buddhist thought? Any in, instinctual response to that? Is, uh, is that too narrow? Is that too narrow? I don't know. I mean, would, would you think, would you be comfortable with it being Buddhist thought, or, or are we actually on the right track with talking about all religions and making it an academic center for learning about all religions rather than just, you know, single and one? Because I think that's kind of where we've been going with it for the last little while. Mm -hmm. We've just kind of gotten a little bit, I don't want to say stuck, but we've kind of gotten focused on it. But, uh, Maybe it, maybe it needs to be broader. The college will naturally be as broad as what we teach, and we will be teaching all the religions. So I think we certainly will do that. The question now is, can those who enjoy particular veins of that build a community that's meaningful for that community so that it, it's richer and deeper in ways that I can never get to? Because be, being a part of a community, uh, of a religious community, takes you to depths that is wonderful. And, and I want to participate in those depths. But I, I can't get there. But I can certainly sense that Evan could get there in some, with, with, with ease. Mm -hmm. And I would love to open the door for him to sort of say, wow, I'd love to share what I know with a community. Well, we need 
to make sure that the table is open for you to be able to do that. Um, and, and Kate and Scott, the same invitation is wherever you are. You're not sensing you have a community here. But I almost guarantee that if your ideas were spread around a little bit so people could sort of listen and go, huh, I sort of like that. You would, you would be able to build that community of like-minded people. And, and that's what I want to encourage. Is um, there a benchmark organization that you could say, I want to be like them, that's doing this somewhere? No. I can't imagine it. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just curious. It's a great thought. I spent, I spent my whole life doing things that I've never encountered anybody else that was as weird as I am. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. Let me, let me take a step back. The Department of Religion at USC, which is my training mm -hmm. center, really, they have, they, they purposefully created inroads all over LA so that as students come into the, into the department, if, particularly Judaism, if they were, if they were wanting to focus on Buddhism or Judaism, they, the, the scholars all know the adherents in the Jewish community and in the Buddhist community and in the Islamic community so that there was a relationship so that the department could immediately send folks. And then they would bring those folks in for lectures and conversations. So I was pretty used to seeing that, that ebb and flow in and out of the department of, of specialists in the various religions. But I've never, I've never again, it, it's extraordinarily hard to say how do we catalyze new cultivation of a religious community. That's a much harder task, mm -hmm. much, much harder, as opposed to just enjoying the, the religious communities around you. In, in Portland, man, I took my students to every temple and, and mosque and everything I could find. Um, just and it became my way, and I became the catalyst of trying to make sure I could I could have ebb and flow of bringing in all the scholars that I could find in Portland. Um, this is a much smaller community, sure. um, but it it first of all needs folks that have a, a heart for openness to each other, so that it's okay wherever you are and wherever you are, and and it's okay if you talk through your issues with us even if we don't specifically self-define as where you're at. We are open and listening and wanting you to grow, and you will grow more if you can talk to us. That, that's the openness of the table I'd like to find. Um, oh, only two of you. Oh, I'm pushing buttons and it's not catching Only two of you are here when I sort of laid this out. I'd like for you to set up my three ways that I want you to really Come to the study of religion, and I use these areas of focus. I'd like for you to be to be thoughtful uh, on what awareness is. I'd like for you to be thoughtful on what understanding is, and I'd like for you to be thoughtful when it comes to focus. The point I'd like to make when it comes to awareness is all religions in your worldview deserve awareness. All religions in your worldview. Some of you have heard this, but when I was in our home in Portland, on my left side was a Reformed Jew. Across the street was an Auschwitz Jew. Caddy Corner was, uh, I'm not sure their religious tradition, but a gay couple. I never figured out what their religious, religious tradition was. On this corner was an Italian Catholic. Right behind me was a Muslim. Now that's literally the houses that were immediately around our home in Portland. I have a responsibility to understand all of those religious traditions, would be my argument. I have no excuse for not having a good awareness to all of my immediate neighbors. Then when I say, well, what, what, you know, what's going on in McCall? Well, I find tremendous diversity in McCall. They're all coming here just as much as they're coming to Portland. And for those people that I interact with, I have a responsibility of understanding them and being aware of their religious traditions. And some of them are tough. Some of them are tough. Does that make sense? You have the responsibility of awareness of all religions in your worldview. 
Does that make sense? Hard, tough, irritating. Some of you might not like some of them. I'm not saying believe what they say. I'm just saying be aware of what they are. And that takes hard work. Huh. Especially in a little town in, 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 in Idaho. So it, it's a responsibility I think we have. What happens? What, what options do you have if you're not aware of the religious traditions around you? Okay? The Muslim behind me. What are my options? The Muslim. He lives right next door. I got a table in my house I bought from him. I have to remember that every time I look at that table. My Muslim friend, I bought that table from him. What are my options if I don't know who he is as a Muslim? Fear. Number one probably is fear. I'm probably going to be afraid of him. What else might be the result of my failure to be aware of what his world is like? Fear. Ignorance. Ignorance. Frustration. It's all wrapped up. And so I would argue that our second step is we have a responsibility of the major religions deserve understanding. To work at it. I really need to work at understanding my Muslim friend. If he's that close to me, I really should try and understand. I have a responsibility to Scott now to try and understand what his tradition is. It, it's just, he's here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure I've done enough work in your field to really have a good conversation of, of, of what's happening. And so I think that's really important that I do that. Um, and so uh, my computer just died. So uh, yeah. I've tried, I tried to do a lot on it tonight. Yeah. And we'll see. We'll see if it's a happy camper or not. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so I, have, I have an awareness of all, of, of, of all religions in my worldview. I, have, I, I should have an understanding of all major religions. Again, uh, there, there's minor religions that I, I, you know, it'd be tough, but I, I think I have a responsibility for all the major religions around me. But my third point is to bring focus on one area of interest. Bring focus on that. Now when I say that, we live in a culture, and our Buddhist monk, made this exact move. If you're going to live the Buddhist, you should only live the Buddhist lifestyle and, and, and dedicate yourself to Buddhism. Well, I've heard that most of my life in Christianity, that if you're going to, you know, you've got to be a Christian. If you're not a Christian, and then they lay out this list of bad things that's going to happen if, if you're not a Christian. And so religions have this capacity of saying, it, you, you know, you need to focus on us, but when you focus on us, you can only focus on us, and it. we're it, and nobody else can be in the playing field. I vastly prefer that if we thought about religion as we think about health care. I have a primary specialist that takes care of me most of the time. I enjoy the work of that primary specialist, but once in a while, I need the work of a specialist, and I go over to the specialist and I, I get some help in cardiology or I get some help in gastroenterology or in neurology. They can help me in specific ways. So I am usually focused on my primary care physician and working together to create health in my life. But once in a while, I've got to go find a specialist. I would argue we should deal with religions that way. We should have our own primary focus, but we should have a good enough awareness of the religions around us so that if you, had a, if you sort of knew this new Lutheran community, there's a really interesting Lutheran pastor that everybody in the Lutheran church is talking about. And it's sort of my responsibility to at some point wander in there, meet the guy, and figure out what his, what his take on life is, so at some point I can enjoy, his, enjoy him and what he has to offer. Um, just like I need to get to know Evan better, because I think he has a whole lot of things that I can learn from him. And I don't know of anybody else in my orbit that could teach me some things in meditation that I think you could teach me. 
So it's my responsibility to come to a specialist and learn about meditation, because my tradition is horrible on meditation. Just flat out horrible. They haven't got a clue what meditation is. So, so if I know that my, my tradition has a weakness in, in, in a field that you've got a strength, and I know it's not going to, the only thing it's going to do is make me healthier in my own spiritual life, aren't I a fool if I just stay with my primary care religion specialist, and I say, i got a specialist over here that could teach me something helpful, but I'm going to ignore him because, you know, not, not interesting. Mm -hmm. And so... And so you you be, you become you, you you bring a different a different perspective to that. So anyway, give me a response there. What do you think of the healthcare form of religious understanding instead of the what I call serial? Well, let me make it up. Um, uh, as the, the, most people have to assume I I also uh, let me see if I can remember a bit of your tradition. I was a Catholic, and then I wasn't a Catholic. I was a Methodist, then I wasn't a Methodist. I was a... Who was your third one? Um, uh, do, do you see how we tend to sort of be these on and off switches when it comes to religion? I would argue you're still a Catholic, you're still a Methodist, and you're now a Buddhist. I think that's who you are. I'd like for you to own that and enjoy your original Catholic heritage, your Methodist involvement, your, your now Buddhist engagement. That's who you are, just like your fingerprints. You can't turn those switches off and say, I'm not a Catholic anymore. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and it's contributed in some wonderful ways into your life, even if you now choose not to be. How's that sound, folks? Does that sound too weird in our religious culture that we could never get there? That everyone would beat the crap out of us because you're not them? Um, response, please. I think that a lot of it comes down to just like labels or people want to have a neat package to put you into, you know? But that's why I always feel like I'm non sectarian because it's just, I, there's a lot of beliefs that I have, you know? But one argument that I hear is, you know, there's many paths up a mountain, but at some point you got to choose one path and stay on it to get to the top. If you keep just circumambulating the mountain, you know, and going from path to path to path, you're never going to get to the top or whatever. But, um, and I, I see some value to that, but I think that's kind of what you're saying. Have your primary, you know, your primary uh, religion or healthcare practitioner who you go to most of the time and be open to, you know, taking different trails. That's a good analogy. Are you okay with that? Oh, yeah. Good analogy. What about when you just go up the mountain? Like you don't take a trail, you don't think about it. Right? You go you just bushwhack. Bushwhack. No, like, no, 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 no. Like, you just literally <laughs> take what feels right to you. Like, mm -hmm. you just, I mean, I, I'm really in the hiking, and like, I actually can speak from experience, like, I prefer not go on like you know the designated trail like I take game trails and sometimes mm -hmm. I like see something cool and wander off like uh, I I like what you said about you know like the labels and stuff because I was when he was speaking thinking something similar like why have the barrier of your neighbors being defined under their religion like I mean if you share some core values or moral standards like those are more important than saying like oh you're a Muslim you're a Jew you're this or you're that like mm -hmm. the important things are the the positive common things we share and learning from each other mm -hmm. because like you said about you and your religious history like you're you've gone through all these religions but I'm sure like the best way I can assimilate it is that there's things you've held on to I'm sure from oh, each yeah. of those experiences mm -hmm. that are still important to who you are now like I like For I sure. really like
learn what you can from anybody that's better than you are, okay, that knows something more than you know, learn from that person. And then there's this, uh, another pathway. I have one teacher who insists that you all paint in a specific way, and it's all Rembrandt, and it is a specific way, and if you don't paint like he says, and make it look exactly like he makes it, even though it's brilliant, then you are nothing, and you are not a good artist unless you don't end up emulating this particular master, and he's very, very good, but who needs it? You know, you, you realize that, no, the idea of being able to find somebody who knows more than you do, and it doesn't have to be, and then find another person that knows more than you do, and find somebody that knows more than you, and learn from that, that it's a different concept than this one dude that says, we will do it this way, and follow me for six years, and then you'll have this method down. It's a, it's a different, <laughs> it's a different pathway altogether to say, well, I'm going to learn as much as I can, and then choose uh, how I'm going to make my art. <laughs> I'm going to take what I learned from all these different wonderful people and say, I like this. And then I have to create my own yeah. from it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of weird, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know my objectives, and I... Uh, so that final one is it is focus on at least one religion, and I'm not saying for the rest of your life, I'm just saying tonight, we're focusing on Buddhism. Okay? That, that's where we're focusing right now. Now, tomorrow is another day. You get to make different decisions. Um, but tonight, let's focus on one religion and learn what that religion can mean to us. And that deserves your focus. Oh, and so when we look at Buddhism in the good life, Buddhism has some ex extraordinarily, extraordinarily different images. And as you look at these two images, what can you learn from them? There's like very clean and happy. <laughs> Which one? They both look very clean both and happy. Both look clean and happy. <laughs> There's there's contentment there. No humor in one. Uh, and and no use humor. use right or left when you. Oh, uh, uh, right uh, hand, uh, right uh, hand uh, is. Uh, is uh, lots more, of there's more clear humor, humor and total joy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Less reserved. What else are you seeing? Our emphasis on the spirituality of yoga. What do you see? Pardon? The posture on the left. Posture on the left is pretty classic yoga posture. Mm -hmm. Concentration. And seeing some concentration. Okay. What are you seeing on the right from a posture point of view? Pretty relaxed. <laughs> pretty relaxed. Yeah. Now, that's your classic posture. Um, um, which one do you see more in the public? This one is the one you see more often in the public. Who is it? Which one or both? The one on the right is the Buddha. Okay. Who's this one on the left? Okay. Did you think that that was Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha? I didn't know. Didn't know. Okay. But because we see this one most often in public, we think that this is the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha. What's really interesting is there was a Chan monk named Chi Tzu, or Oichi, from Fenghua, in what is now the province of Zhengjiang. Chi Tzu 
was an eccentric but much loved character who worked small wonders such as predicting the weather. Chinese history assigned the date of 920, 907 CE to Chi Tzu's life, which means he lived considerably later than the historical the Buddha, uh, Sukiyama. Uh, according to tradition, just before uh, Chi Tzu died, he received, received, revealed himself as an incarnation of the Buddha. Uh, and, and was named in the Tripitaka of Buddhas in future ages. Um, and so, this, is, this we often call this the happy Buddha or the fat Buddha. This actually, uh, 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 1,500 years after Siddhartha, the Buddha. And, and look, at, and, and, and as, far as, as far as what it takes to attain this look, He's also called the Fat Buddha. Uh, and, and if you think of the Buddha's life, he would have had almost no opportunity of getting fat. He just wouldn't have had a chance of being, a, as we discover his life, we, we will discover he, he lived as an aesthetic, as an ascetic. Uh, and so as an ascetic lifestyle, it's virtually impossible for him to be fat. And yet, this is the, and literally I walked into the temple in Portland, and this is the one I was talking to the, 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 uh, our monk friend about. And this was the representation in the main hall of the Buddhist temple. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> but, and so then he, he lived 1,500 years a after the Buddha. Uh, but called himself a Buddha and was a very good character, a very happy person, brought a lot of good to his community, and was a clearly good Buddha. Um, but he wasn't this Buddha. Now that tells us a whole lot about Buddhism just in one go. What's it tell about a Buddhist tradition that just doesn't matter if this is the statuary in its temple or if it looks like this, which is probably a closer representation of the Buddha that we'll be studying more in the historical context. But what's that tell us about Buddhism? That goes with our conversation here tonight. I think one of the biggest things is they don't um, necessarily be like, we have a god and we have a son of god so much where the one figure, you know, there's the historical Buddha that even he is well known for saying like there's been countless Buddhas before me and there'll be countless Buddhas after me and the Buddha, you know finding the Buddha within is a big um, concept whereas in a lot of other religions it's there's Muhammad or there's Jesus or there's you know there's the son of God you know. I don't want to be rude but it kind of reminds me just a little bit of our concept of Saint Nicholas. Okay. So, right. so St. Nicholas was uh, a monk, or was he a priest? St. Nicholas was in memory of that. Yeah. Anybody can Google anyway, he, had, he wore, it evidently, what they, he they were one of those. But in the beginning, when you see the, the beginning of what, what St. Nicholas looked like, he was a, a not an overeater. He was a skinny guy who just happened to be have a, a concept of of giving and taking care of children. And then, as time progressed, we ended up with the fat Buddha and Saint Santa Claus. Okay. Interesting the concept. Okay. Where all so, so that the story is adjust. Best. The story is adjust to fit the context. Even though there was a real Saint Nicholas. And, and yet we have all these people that dress up as Santa Claus, and we don't say, oh, you're a bunch of fakers. It's just um, something we enjoy that particular thing. So, So bounce off of Evan's comments, or bounce off of how mythic representations adjust over the years, that, and, and of what, of what Lynette was, was focusing on. Or take a new path. Okay, Ashley. I have a question, like if anyone in the room knows, like, because I don't know right now, and I probably could do some research on my own. Are there many Buddhas at one time? Like, like at any given time, or is there just 
like specifically the one incarnation of the Buddha at a time. Try that one? I think so, yeah. I don't think there's anything where there's like, oh, there's this Buddha of this age. Uh It's like everybody has Buddha nature. I I think that's the concept. So all people have the possibility of being the Buddha within them. And so um, and so that that becomes a fundamental way of, of encouraging yourself, of, of seeing what's within you. Uh, and so there could be many, so I think Evan, what you're trying to say is there could be many Buddhas at the same time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the possibility is there and it could be likely. The dilemma is we tend to look at this historically. Mm-hmm. And even your comment about the Buddha, there were many Buddhas before me, there will be many Buddhas after me gives us almost that inkling that there was just one at that point in time that we should focus on. Mm -hmm. And so those of us with the historical understandings that we in America tend to bring to the conversation tend to think linearly. But there's nothing to minimize that. But there are, if you were to watch um, The Little Buddha, anybody seen the movie The Little Buddha? Mm -hmm. From that, you get a sense of a linear progression of ensoulment. I shouldn't use ensoulment in Buddhist one. In in no soul, or in the the rebirth migration of of the, give me the better word, um, coming out of Hinduism, you tend to want to use all the Hindu terms. Incarnation. Um, Incarnation, thank you. So that the incarnation of the Lama the little Buddha story is is really that there's a, that the the Lama has died and they're searching for the new incarnation, uh, and they're searching the world for that incarnation, and uh, and so you get that sense of linearity that comes just from telling a story, uh, uh, but I don't think again that should that should minimize the possibilities there could be many Buddhas at any given time. But the story, when told, tends to be linearly of one individual to another individual to a new individual. And, uh, and so it, you, you sort of live in that challenge. It's a really good question. Yeah. You say the word the Buddha, you don't say a Buddha. Mm-hmm. You know. That's right. And so we do use a definite article when it comes to the Buddha, which indicates that in, in a conversation like this, we are going to bring a historical uh, precision to our language. That there was one that will become our anchor point. When we say the Buddha, people will typically respond by saying, Oh, you mean Siddhartha. Uh, lived about 500 BC. Yeah. Not lived at 1080. Um, and so, see, if you want to use that language. And so that, that it, it, right? Great conversation. Okay. Um, I, I was wondering if they purposely posed him in a non-yoga fashion. Or am I wrong that there is a yoga position that this would be acceptable for? I don't think I've ever seen a yoga pose. Yeah, I've not, yeah, yeah so I'm just, you guys are my experts on yoga. I, I've never seen this as an official yoga pose. Okay. So I was fascinated that they posed him like this. Whereas now when we come back to this, you're always seeing the Buddha, or often in a yoga pose, unless it's his death stance. And then, then you see pictures of him, him reclined on, on the, the bench, and he's, he's sort of in a death posture, or a, a dying posture. But the vast majority of times when you see a representation of the Buddha, it's in a yoga posture. Right? So what's that tell you about yoga and Buddhism? He was a yogi. He was a yogi. That's right. What's a yogi mean? Uh, A yoga practitioner. A yoga practitioner. (laughs) You can assume that the Buddha would be in in the ancient lineage of a yogi or a yoga practitioner in the way that he lived his life. So that so that yoga has a wonderful connection to Buddhism, and they interact in a wonderful way. And, and this picture defines that nicely, 
And this picture doesn't do a very good job of it. <laughs> Though I think most of the, of the happy Buddhas or fat Buddhas that I see, they are in a yoga posture. Are they not? Does anybody have a fat Buddha in their house that they use? <laughs> is it in a yoga posture or is it in this funky one? Little fat guys yeah. In the little cabinet bathroom. Right. And this is going to sound terrible, but I bought this pack of beer one time. Quite a while back, and I've been intending to turn it into some form of art. They're like these green, green bottles that are a happy, happy. I've been sitting around for a long time, like intending to turn it into a project. Actually, I got asked this morning at breakfast. Make good incense holders. At breakfast, what are you going to do with those? And I was like, just sell for good luck. I've really liked that thought for a long time. <laughs> okay. It'd be wrong. So I don't. And, and now the other thing that I was struggling with with our happy Buddha yeah. is the hand signals. Whenever you see Buddhism, you'll see hand signals. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. do you know how to interpret those yet? I'm not going to interpret them for you. Okay. Let's let's, let's work them. It's going to be this. This is going to mean something, and it's going to be this. This is going to mean something. Okay, so I just want to cue you that we're going to have to learn the hand signals of Buddhism. Okay? Is that ring finger or ring So this is, no, I don't think, I don't, I, no. oh, is it? Does it matter oh, which hand? This one is second finger. This one is first finger. Is that correct? Yeah. Unless, unless. You got it. We keep it. Okay, so. so your left, left hand down. Okay, so I want you to see that tonight, though we're not going to solve the problem. It means something. What's it mean? And, and the, why was that going to be important? That you understand the hand signals. Why is it important that you can see the hand signals? Why is that important that you can read it? The, each major has a different um, meaning of what he's teaching or trying to express through his posture. His posture is teaching you something. His hands are teaching you something. His look at there's so many things that it's teaching you. Um, oh, um, look at look at the look at this, and then look at this. Okay, look at those. Those are identical. Okay, now what what's that trying to teach you? Because it's very different. It's, it, it's, it's unique, whatever it is, what that's trying to teach you. Can you see that now? Mm. Okay. Uh, what are you sitting on? What's that trying to teach you? What's the clothing trying to teach you? What's the hairstyle trying to teach you? As you look at it, realize how little you know about whatever is being try, they're trying to teach. But if you go into any Buddhist temple, you're probably going to see a representation like this. And yet you're going to miss a boatload if you don't work the symbolism of whatever's happening in front of you. This, prosperity, good life, yahoo, I want it in my bathroom because I'll feel good if I, have a, if I have a happy Buddha in my bathroom. Every time I go in my son's business, Prince Shop McCall, he's got a happy Buddha sitting right on his counter. <laughs> I think I know how much Buddhism he knows, too. And uh, so it's just a symbol of happiness and prosperity. And he thinks that's wonderful. Uh, and so that, that, that I want you to begin just sensing uh, where we're at, is there's lots to learn in a symbolic, uh, in a symbolic world. Why are symbols more important to Buddhism than symbols are to Americans in the 21st century. Why are symbols more important to most Buddhists in from 500 BCE to the 21st century than symbols are important to you? Why are you not very symbolic? Maybe my question. I would say, yeah, that we are, we just have a completely different set different of symbols. Of different set of symbols that you interpret. Uh, let's test that. All of you have different clothing on. 
I would argue you're all trying to tell me something by the clothing you have on. Look at look at each other now. Here's my shirt. You would you agree you're trying to tell me something by what you're wearing? Well, Ashley doesn't think so. Okay. No thought in Ashley. Well, whatever she's wearing, we cannot attach it to her identity. Well, yeah, in a way, I Can we? Um, okay. Yeah, that's truthful. You're like, high, like me. But I, I just, yeah, like I don't have a set like Okay. Uh, so just think of yourself. That you have represented yourself as who you are. You, you, you've purposely done something today. When you left the house wearing what you're wearing, and you're trying to communicate to everybody else around you. I'm just trying to prove Evan's point here. We are all highly symbolic. We just have a different symbol set. Okay? I mean, everything I've got on has a purpose today. And I could have worn totally different everything else, everything that I'm wearing. But I had a, I had a, a point I was trying to make with everything I put on. I would argue we all do that every day. We do that with the, the, the things that, that symbolize who we are, why we did this, um, whatever we have here, whatever the length of our hair is, whatever the shortness or non-entity uh, of hair. We're all trying to say something with every move that we've made our entire life. We are highly symbolic. I assume when every, anybody comes past me at Albertsons, they're trying to tell me something first. Mm -hmm. And they haven't said a word yet. That they, they're, they're teaching me something about who they are. And then I try and connect with whatever I see and say something with whatever. Because if you come in with a, 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 any sports symbol, I probably know it. So I'm going to launch a sports conversation. Because I, I assume that's meaningful to you. And I can talk faster in your symbol language than any other language I can talk. And I can get deeper and faster if I, if I use that as a symbol language. Um, and, and so it's just the way I interact with people when I've only got 10 or 15 seconds to say something meaningful. I start with whatever I think they're trying to tell me. How did you figure out that the animators, the cartoonists, were in your life? I had, I had a, whole group of, a whole group of folks come by me. And I don't know how I eventually got to that. Maybe it was an Oregon I, I'm sure one of them had a symbol on, on a shirt that took me there. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they were clearly together. They were, you know, I, I just do this with a group of folks. I try and sort out what's happening in town and what people... And we, here we had world-class animators that were meeting here in McCall. And they, the, the, the lead person I was talking to just started throwing out the names of all the Academy Awards that had been won. And, and and the and, and you know and all the animation projects this team of about eight or ten people had done and it was a world class group of folks uh, and it was sort of a wonderful conversation that if you can sort out symbols of people you can go you can go a long way with them okay so we're going to think about symbolism because that's the richness and the depth of any religion is how does it represent its symbols and present its symbols. And each religious tradition has a different, different symbol set. But the, the, the beauty of Buddhism is it comes from a non-literate society. Buddhism comes from a non-literate society. So it's going to be speaking in non-literate ways. And so the reason that you're going to see, or one of the reasons you're going to see symbols every time you go into a Buddhist temple is because most people through most of history have been non-literate. So they can't read the Buddha. They can only interpret the symbol system of the Buddha. And so they're all trained to know that when they see this symbol, it means something. When they see this symbol, it means something. When the legs are postured, it means something because that's their language. It's the language of symbols, which is a much deeper language than the symbol system we use when we construct books. Much deeper, much more meaningful. It's a full story that comes with each and every symbol. We saw that with the Ganesha. 
Remember how the Ganesha was postured so that each each element of the of, had a moral tail to it. Uh, you have to ride the mouse because the mouse is desire, and you have to conquer it or stuff like that. So remember, if you didn't see that, if you weren't here for the Ganesha lecture, uh, we went through all the symbols of the Ganesha, which is meant to tell you how, that again we're dealing with a non-literate society. They live in these symbols, they communicate in these symbols, they learn and are instructed by the symbols. And so we have a task to do to, uh, to work through. Comments on symbolism that we've already sparked. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Challenging? There's a great challenge there, is to learn the symbol system of Buddhism. Okay. And so modern Buddhism in, in, in Asia presents this picture. What is going to be incredibly striking, and, and so um, uh, the Theravada Buddhism that Evan was talking about is particularly Southeast Asia, here, Sri Lanka, centering in Burma and, and Thailand, uh, and Laos, Mahayana, particularly and dominated by the seacoast of China and Vietnam because of the Chinese influence in Vietnam, very much so in Japan so, and Korea. So Mahayana Buddhism, another sect uh, of Buddhism. Uh, and I'm going to say this, Varyayana, but I... Vajrayana? Vajr. The, the J, J is, means a Vajrayana. Ma, uh, Mongolia, Tibet, uh, and so you can see its representations here. And so, so there's modern Buddhism in Asia today. Right now, that's what Buddhism looks like in Asia. What's so striking about that? What about India? Yeah, what about India? How much Buddhism is in India? Not much. I would suspect there's more than what the map is showing. Okay, but it would probably be in. It's a mostly Hindu. Okay, Hindu so Muslim. And what would it, what did we discover about Hinduism in India? And an Indian and being a Hindu and an Indian. There's thousands of different kinds. Yeah, there's just thousands of different kinds, and and there's a political connection. And if you're an Indian, you're a Hindu. If you're a Hindu, you're an Indian. There, there's a political connection, which necessitates pressure against any other religion. We'll discover that, uh, that Christianity is very localized. We'll discover that Islam is very localized in Pakistan uh, and over, over here uh, in um, um, uh, the name of just a state. Uh, um, as far as a political uh, 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 pro uh, country that is was defined to be Muslim, um, and so again, oh, uh, Hinduism really pressures every other religion, uh, and so you'll see that. that little dot over there. This one? Yeah. I don't know. Kalmaya is what it says. I don't know. I, well, it, it look, it's it's part of Russia. It looks like a. The enclave of Russia, here. Russia's reaching down here. So, I don't know. Okay, but, but I think that's the point, is we're talking about religions of India, and there's precious, not very many, except uh, right here, again, the story of the Buddha is coming out of the kingdom in Nepal, uh, and, and, and in, in the northern parts of India is where the story is going to be set. But the, the story never migrated this way, except in enclaves, and those wouldn't be strong enough to sort of give us too many dots. Um, but it primarily went north and east. And so the story of Buddhism is a story of migration in this direction, not in this direction. Hinduism uh, treated Buddhism as a sect and isolated it, and kept it pretty well out uh, of the dominant Indian society. Here's our regional distribution of, of Buddhism when we talk about it. And so when we look at a map of Asia Pacific, that's why we start there, because there's a half a, half a billion Buddhists, and most of them are here in, the, in Asia. So Buddhism has had a wonderful impact on the Asia Pacific region. 
and most of our, our literature, our scho uh, the scholarly production, the conversation has been dominated by Asia Pacific in, uh, because they're the number one region. And so when we look at Africa, North Africa, Europe, Latin America, we discover <coughs> that North America is the second largest concentration of Buddhism outside of Asia. Isn't that interesting? So there's a, there's a strength in a Buddhism here in North America. And why is that? Why is there a good concentration of Buddhism in North America? Well, it's a big continent, and we have a lot of people that have migrated from other parts of the world, and we have a lot of freedom of religion here. Mm -hmm. And who's it fair to say um, brought the religion? With them, when they migrated. Yeah, a lot of Chinese and Japanese people. We're going to assume that our Chinese and Japanese populations are going to be Buddhists. Yeah. Why? Because that's the dominant context that they're coming from. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to bring their traditions with them. And so if you go to Buddhist temples, what kind of Buddhist temples will you find in North America? Usually three different kinds. Which ones have you seen? You'll see Chinese Buddhist, Buddhist temples, you'll see Japanese Buddhist temples, and you'll see Tibetan Buddhist temples. Okay, why? Because that's the dominant culture of folks that have migrated to America, brought it with them. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and that has given us our concentrations. Uh, Buddhist uh, practices in North America. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Buddhism in Boise. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can take this just a bit. Okay, that's if you Google Buddhism in Boise. It's still not as good. I could find three, and I don't know them well enough to break them down. So that um, I don't know if they're Chinese, Japanese, Tibetan, or just a good old American garden variety, which sort of mixes them all up. Um, uh, and so, uh, anybody want to try the Vietnamese uh, saying for their, their community? <laughs> we learned that Vietnam is strongly Buddhist, coming in from the Chinese group. Okay, so that there's a, uh, there's a Vietnamese. I would assume that's a der derived Chinese Buddhism, but I could be wrong. The Vietnamese Buddhism might be different than Chinese Buddhism. Don't we? Um, so I hope I can visit that, that uh, Buddhist temple. We have a group called the Compassion and Insight Center, the heart of the, dom the, uh, the Dharma. And, you know, with that is the dominant picture. Mm -hmm. I figure we probably pretty got a pretty strong American Buddhist influence in that group. Don't know. But uh, that would be my, my oh, instinct. Uh, with that would be a, uh, an American presentation of Buddhism. Um, and then we have the Boise Institute for Buddhist Studies. Okay. Um, and again, I mean, when you use Theravada, Mahayana, as you're, as you're defining sects of Buddhism, I don't know which one's which, or if they you know, mix them all up. I, I don't see anything specifically Tibetan. I don't think, see, um, uh, so I just don't get a lot of distinction when I just read their names. Um, if I were to bring up the same page of Buddhism in Portland, you'd clearly know you've got Chinese, Japanese, and Tibetan. You, you just know that just from the way they present themselves in the telephone book. Um, I'm not getting that here in Boise. It, it, when, when I've, and, and I've seen this in other religious traditions, um, and, and particularly in, in Islam. Um, and so the, uh, the, the mosque in Boise is a collection of the various strains of Islam. They're just collecting together as many Muslims as they can to make a mosque. We've only got one. And so they begin collecting these up. So you can imagine the struggles as they try and communicate with each other between Shia uh, or Sunni or, or all the various, uh, various strains of Islam that can create real struggles in everywhere else in the world. But in Boise, they sort of do what they can do. I'm wondering if the same thing is happening here. So if anybody would like to do some research, there's some wonderful research just right here in Boise. 
to figure out, well, we've got Buddhist studies, but we have strains of Buddhism that are, they concentrate on. It'd be interesting to know that. Perfectly. Okay. Um, okay. We'll, we'll finish on this with this slide. So we spent a lot of time, five weeks, working on Hinduism. Um, this is what Buddha, Buddhism is not. The parts that it rejects of Hinduism. So it's going to reject the idea of the eternal Brahman and the Atman. Okay? Now, um, um, we're, we need to remember the Brahman is, and, and there's, lot, there's lots of derivations of the word Brahman, is a designation for the one, the real, the ground of the universe. And so Buddhism is going to reject that. It's going to reject the Atman. That's that true self that's identical with the Brahman. So it's going to reject the Brahman and it's going to reject that true self. And, and in the way that it's going to reject it that might be helpful to Americans is, is in Solman doctrine, was the, you could find a lot of comfort in, in Solman. Your soul is what is the Atman within Hinduism. But in Buddhism, they're going to be very clear they're going to flip that, and then, so they're going to say no soul, no self, no soul. So they're going to flip off of the insolment language that we sort of were, were dabbling around with Hindu doctrine, and they're going to purposefully, in language, going to, going to invert it. And so we're going to see that within Buddhism. Um, uh, and so the, the way out of, of samsara, again, the knowledge that you can glean is what's going to be rejected. And that knowledge is knowing the real Atman, thus knowing the Brahman, means moksha, the liberation cycle, caused by ignorance, desire, and karma. There, and, and it's this path of knowledge that they're going to, to reject. They're going to, they're going to agree with ignorance, desire, and karma being a problem. So we're going to, we're going to get agreement there, that that's causing you religious and spiritual disharmony. And if we can, if we can, but the ignorance that they're going to be chasing with the path of knowledge in Buddhist language is the wrong body of knowledge. So we, we're not going to go down the Vedic scriptures. We're not going to chase the Vedic scriptures that we're reading. That's not where we're going to go with Buddhism. Buddhism is going to have a different body of scriptures that it's going to be looking at. Buddhism is going to reject what Kate didn't like very much. And that was the caste system. Okay? Yahoo, right? <laughs> Gates happy. <laughs> caste system is going in the tank in Buddhism. Um, and so we'll have to figure out how they deal with issues. Uh, particularly, how do they deal with women? Um, uh, because the, the, the fundamental starting place of the caste system really is the distinction between male and female. Uh, so how is Buddhism going to deal with that? Are they going to... Are they going to reach into that issue better than we saw in Hinduism. Uh, oh, and just a great story today, I got two minutes. And, and the importance of worshiping the gods, they become an empty theistic religion. Now, why did I phrase it that way? How could I have phrased it? They become an empty theistic religion. No Instead of religion. saying a atheistic, atheistic religion. Yeah. Okay? Also, the God, it's, there's just a lack of one. Okay, so this is this is a Williams. I've never seen anybody use that phrase. Uh, it's just my way of communicating because I've seen everybody say Buddhism is an atheistic religion, and I go, "Whoa, you know, this is this is not working for me," um, because the way atheists are perceived in America is not what Buddhism is. And so if you use the language of atheism, you are going to arrive in the wrong place of what Buddhism mm -hmm. is. They are an empty theistic, simply they don't want to spend any time talking about it. They just empty the religion of theistic conversation. It isn't that they are, they are against the god or gods, they just don't want to go there. Uh, and so that's why I just say they're emptying the theistic language out of the religious. 
and 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 so and that and that also gives me a door as to how come every time what's my question? How come every time I've gone into a Buddhist temple, I get relig- I get another god staring me at, 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 at me, and I'm going. Where did the God come from? This is supposed to be an atheistic religion. No, it's an empty theistic that because of its emptiness, somebody else can fill and do a pretty good job of it. Um, and so it's going to give this term is going to give me a chance of explaining why Buddhism is always seemingly aligned with other God structures. It will, it will allow me to, to, to make my point there. Okay? So that's what Buddhism is, is not. Comments on what Buddhism is not. You spend a whole lot of time figuring out what Hinduism is, and now all of a sudden we're chucking, and most of it, or some serious parts of it, out the window. Uh, any comments on that? I'm just reading a bunch of books where um, they do talk a lot about the gods and deities and angels and ghosts. And so I think they definitely acknowledge all of that as being and accept that there are gods, there are ghosts, there are deities, um, but they 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 have like some a lot of stories I've read where the gods actually come to like listen to the Buddhist teachings and are actually learning from the Buddha and talk a lot about how having a human life is is one of the best um, ways for us to evolve spiritually, yes. um, and that. You know, being a god or a deity or an angel is almost difficult because you don't have pain, you don't have suffering, you have so much uh, power um, that it's hard to really grasp a lot of the like fundamental truths of nature that humans are in con- you know, constantly dealing with every day. So we're going to have to be sensitive to that. We are not only going to have the, the teachings of the Buddha, but we're going to have 2,500 years of Buddhists talking about Buddhism, dealing in contexts with a whole lot of gods around them. And so some of them won't be quite as packaged up as the Buddha will be. Um, so it's going to be an interesting conversation. Okay, glad you're here. Glad.